Blog Talk Radio. Hello, and welcome to Work Trends with Megan M. Biro. Whether you're here to network, learn, or share, we want you to have fun. During this live broadcast and Twitter chat, we'll discuss the future of work with smart and entertaining guests who value today's business and its impact on the world of work for the future. Stay tuned, because we start in 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another informative Talent Culture Work Trends live podcast and Twitter chat. Um, I want to thank our sponsors and give a special shout out. I can't talk today. I think I need more coffee or something. A special shout out to our friends and sponsors out there. Um, really excited for today's uh, podcast and Twitter chat. Um, you know, I like to talk a lot about leadership, and we know that there's a changing landscape of business, right, that requires a more – something we're going to unfold today called relationship or relational leadership style. What's this all about? What's the hubbub out there? Um, I hope you're on the Twitters, by the way. Check us out at Work Trends hashtag work trends. Um, if you want to be a part of this discussion, either during the podcast or during the Twitter chat portion of it, that'd be awesome. Come on over and join the conversation. So why is this whole business landscape and relational leadership style thing important? Because the traditional world of work that existed in the past, something that's not part of right now or the future, this sort of dictatorial, autocratic thing is no longer an option for productivity from followers. I actually posted um, on Forbes, on my weekly column, um, a post just uh, a few days ago, a few days ago called Five Great Ways to Hack Your Leadership Style. And if you want to check it out, go do it. I'll be kind of unfolding a little bit more about my angle on all of this. But most importantly, today we have a guest who is an author, he's a former New England Patriots linebacker, Dr. Jason Carthen. And we're going to be discussing exemplary leadership and its positive impact on the workplace and all that jazz. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Jason Carthen, who can be found on Twitter at Jason Carthen, C-A-R-T-H-E-N. And Jason just told me in the green room he hasn't been on Twitter all that much. So I'm hoping you guys can throw him a line and uh, be, be part of the community with he and I today. Um, let's encourage Jason to, to use the work trends hashtag so he can be part of this discussion. So Jason has a super cool background. Um, he's known as the leadership linebacker, and I believe he's got a, tr- a fancy trademark on that, actually. And, again, he's a former professional football player for the New England Patriots right here. I'm, I'm here in Cambridge, Mass., so I know them well, um, the hometown team here. He's highly sought after as an international speaker in the areas of leadership, motivation, and identifying purpose in life, something that I think we can all relate to, right? He delivered his own unique brand of inspiration, passion, and practical ideas to people in over 1,000 audiences around the world. Pretty cool stuff. He's the founder of Speak Life University which provides business and leadership development programs for anyone interested in increasing their capacity to influence others. That's something we've been talking a lot about, right? It's influencers, influence, influential influential people, right? This relates to brands and marketing and everything in between now, right? He is a prolific author. He's written over 150 articles and published three books related to leadership, business and personal development, and rumor has it he's got a fourth book on the way. So, Dr. Jason, welcome. It's nice to have hey, you Megan. with us here today. Uh, it's good to be with you. I'm excited about this thing. I am, too. I want to get this party started with you. Now, did you try out? Did you? We did a little testing on the Twitters. Can you see what I'm talking about? You over there using work trends? Yeah, I actually... Yeah, this would be uh, the first time using uh, the work trends thing here. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been well, tweeting and doing all this good stuff, so this should be interesting. We'll have fun with it. 
We're going to have a lot of fun with it. We have fun here every single week, believe it or not. We love using, you know, Twitter is just one platform, obviously. We've got a blog community and I've got a fancy LinkedIn group and all sorts of ways in which we connect, right? Because connecting with people is kind of what it's all about. Um, That's right. Right? Because you can't have talent and leadership and culture and all this fancy stuff that, you know, you and I like to speak about without having people and having that human equation, right? So tell me a little bit about you and and your background, Dr. Jason. I mean, mean, you you didn't just wake up one morning and and become a linebacker for the New England Patriots. Like, (laughs) what's that all about? Tell us. No, no. I mean, there was a journey uh, to the NFL, and quite a bit of it had to do with uh, overcoming challenges. Uh, But during the the time that I had to grow and develop, you know, I learned a lot in my youth and and then going on to college. And, you know, I started thinking, hey, I'm pretty good at this uh, sports thing, and others would tell me the same. And so I had quite a bit of success with it. And then uh, the opportunity came for me to actually go to the NFL and just really made the most of it and you know one of the things I didn't want to do was to relinquish that platform I still wanted to be able to influence and impact people in a very positive way Um, and Uh you know just did the same thing playing in the league and then even thereafter so when did you start playing football Uh, probably I was about nine years old when I first started playing Uh yeah very young that's really young Oh, yeah. And then when did you know that you wanted this as your career? Well, you know, that's that's an interesting question. I don't know that I ever thought I wanted it as a career. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a great opportunity. And then uh, when I was in college, I had a lot of success in college and uh, all-time leader in sacks, tackles, for loss, really? all that stuff. Oh, yeah, all the, fancy, all the fancy. accolades. And where did you go to college? Went to OU, went to Ohio University. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so are you born? So you're born there. and raised Ohio. Are you? No, that's your no, that's I, your home state, or where are you from originally? No, I'm originally from Alabama, uh, and then nice. uh, moved to Ohio. Mm-hmm. Okay. For college. No, it was actually earlier, um, around All high right. school, and then uh, yeah. around high school, yeah, started having some success there, and. Uh, you know, the opportunity to be recruited uh, very heavily uh, from schools all across the country came up and just made the most of that. And I think from there I really wanted to, you know, you mentioned the idea of uh, making football a career. I really wanted to leverage it uh, to be able to go to college and achieve some things. That was the main premise mm-hmm. behind it <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty smart premise, huh? Because I know a whole heck of a lot of football players out there who squander that opportunity due to whatever it is, getting involved in stuff that maybe, you know, they shouldn't be getting involved with, or they just got off course, you know? That's easy to do. Really easy to do. Sure. I I think if you you really don't have a, you know, a guiding sort of – I guess, pathway at that point. It, it can be challenging. It's a lot of temptations, a lot of challenges out there that you have mm-hmm. to overcome, and uh, you really need to be focused, really have to be focused. Did you have a mentor, somebody, either in college or when you started to play, you know, for the NFL? Was there somebody that really stood out to you that supported you, know, I you didn't... that was a, a listening, you know, that was there to listen or – was it just the whole team in general? I'm always just curious. No, I really didn't have a, a mentor uh, per se. I, I think it was more of uh, just trying to watch and kind of get a feel for, you know, what was expected, um, the type of camaraderie. Um, and now I did have people that, you know, there were like, I guess you would say guidelines or bumpers <laughs> that you didn't want to go past. And some people would test the boundaries and the limits and, for me, I, I saw those very clearly in terms of the boundaries and didn't want to go outside of those. And, you know, I just really stayed within it and allowed me to uh, be able to move forward and learn quite a bit, uh, Megan, uh, while I was there and really set me on uh, the path to be successful in life. 
Uh, and it was good. I mean, it was a good opportunity. I look back on it uh, mm-hmm. now, and I'm thankful for that. I bet. Well, how did you transform them from a football player into the leadership linebacker? You know, and you're an author, you're a speaker, you're a leadership expert. You know, you got kind of a fancy thing going on right now. How, yeah, how did that you said transition fancy. go for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for, for me, you? you know, for me, I think um, – we all have to take off the helmet uh, and the shoulder pads at some point when you play. I don't care if it's high school or college or even the NFL. And for me, I was always thinking about that day. And one of the things that I wanted to be intentional with, Megan, was making sure I would be equipped uh, to help others and to really carry out my purpose on a daily basis. And so I went back to school after I sustained an injury in the NFL that really curtailed my career And going back to school, oh, yeah, going back to school really opened up a lot of, um, I guess, doors in terms of what I wanted to do, how I wanted to be intentional with helping people, and it was just great. So the leadership linebacker, it's kind of funny, uh, that was actually born from one of my uh, speaking engagements, and uh, it was kind of cool because... You know, I just have a a passion for leadership. Um, I went to Harvard, then after Harvard I went to Regent and got my Ph.D. in leadership, Mm -hmm. organizational leadership Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, and it really allows me to understand the behavioral aspects of people and why they do what they do, and the two just stuck, the leadership linebacker, you know, so. Love it. And when did that occur? How long have you been doing this? Uh, let's For see. For career. Uh, I have been doing this almost two decades now. Wow. <laughs> That's yeah. huge. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's been great. I remember my first, uh, you mentioned uh, Cambridge. Uh, I remember my first speaking engagement uh, with Paul Newman, uh, the Hole in the Wall oh, yeah. game, gang for oh, the sure. Hill Children. And oh, that yeah. was just. That was just awesome, you know, that lit a fire and yeah. never yeah. really looked back from there. Yeah, I'm from the t- – Paul Newman um, lived in Westport, Connecticut for many years, and I'm from Fairfield, Connecticut, just the town oh, over. Okay. So very familiar – yeah, very familiar with the Hole in the Wall gang and that whole movement and all of what the Newmans have been doing is just amazing. Um, yeah. So, you know, sometimes – you know, there's some great stories out there, and there's great brands, right, that are that are living their brand, so to speak, That's right. right? Absolutely. So, what what is it about leadership? Because you're you're a smart guy. You're also, you know, are you, you still you still you still play football or soccer or basketball? I mean, you still kind of active. You and I haven't met in person yet, so I don't know oh. what you're into. Yoga. Uh, well, I am. I'm very active. You you have to take a look at my uh, Twitter feed and <laughs> all the other things that I do. But I all right. I run marathons. Uh, I still uh, mm-hmm. I still work out. Uh, ran a 26.2 recently. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean I, I definitely right. stay now fit. Now I'm starting to feel a little slack. Go easy What's on that? me, doctor. Doctor J, go easy <laughs> on me. I'm starting to feel like a slacker. You know? Well, we'll get you out there. We'll stay connected. We'll get me out there. <laughs> yeah. We'll get me. I mean, you know, when it comes to marathons, I do yoga. I'm a I'm a huge fan of yoga, by the way. So I'm I'm all about that and cycling and staying healthy. I'm really into it, actually. But, um, boy, you're an inspiration. I tell ya. So uh, well, part thank of you. you is just, I mean, you've you're, you're living your passion. That's really inspiring to all of us, right? So how can a leader truly cultivate the heart of followers, as you like to talk about? Tell me a little bit more about that. Wow, great question. You know, I I think there's, due to our time, I mean, we could do this for hours, (laughs) Megan, but I think a couple of things. When a leader wants to really get to the heart of a follower, a lot of it is going to have a foundation in emotional intelligence and I don't know if people are familiar. Many people probably are with EQ, uh, something that's been – talked about uh, for a period of time, but essentially that leader is able to connect with the follower on a deeper level. They're able to look at that follower and be self-aware 
so they can engage the follower in a certain way, you know, so the follower can really feel feel empowered. They can feel like they have a voice. Uh, they can feel like, you know, they matter. And a lot of the emotional intelligence uh, quadrants would point to the idea of, hey, if a leader is self-aware, if a leader is able to self-regulate and a leader is internally motivated, they are able to then engage the follower's heart in a certain way, as opposed to just, as you mentioned at the top of the show, being dictatorial or autocratic or something like that. They're they're going to be more empathetic. They're going to be more uh, inclined to really engage a follower at a very deeper level so they know they matter. I mean, that part is is crucial and thereby you know megan there then the follower is going to be able to say hey when i show up to work i'm not just showing up to work uh just to do some menial task no it matters that i'm here the leader stops they engage me i feel that it's more of a shared leadership at that point and so that follower is able to just move forward and and just really look forward to going to work and, and carrying out their purpose on a daily basis, more so than just uh, receiving a paycheck. You must be pretty busy because I've got to be honest with you, I think there's a lot of leaders out there who don't have these characteristics, no? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's something that, and again, you mentioned it before, but if you look back in the early uh, 1900s, r- roughly around 1918, Frederick Taylor had the whole idea of scientific management, and that birthed the idea of what leadership should be. So essentially, uh, scientific management says that, hey, every follower is just someone or some individual that's a cog in a wheel. They can be replaced. If they don't do what they need to do, then we'll just get rid of them. So Megan, that started a trend, and many, many organizations, they really adopted that leadership style. But, you know, one of the things that we all need to be aware of is that we have a new generation that's coming along now. and We also have some followers that are fed up (laughs) with that autocratic, uh, dictatorial style, and, and they want more of a relational style. So really, we're trying to stem the tide of what Frederick Taylor was talking about so early on and replace that with more of a relational connection with followers. And, you know, another passion uh, that I also talk about quite a bit is servant leadership, you know, and the connection between emotional intelligence and servant leadership really points to uh, a fully developed leader, leader and follower. So they're able to connect on a deeper level, is it something that everyone embraces right now? Maybe not, you know, but if they want to improve No, I think you're being optimistic, actually. <laughs> I Say mean, that do again? You, do you I'm have sorry. brands or are, are there leaders that you think uh, walk the walk and talk the talk, so to speak? You want to name oh, some yeah. names of brands or leaders that you've met in your adventures over the years oh. that you think are doing leadership um, in, in a way that's impactful? Oh, absolutely. Well, let's just start with the uh, National Football League. I mean, if you talk about Tony Dungy, he's one of the guys that uh, led with a servant's heart and was able to really mobilize players uh, so much so that not only were they very successful on the field, but they were able to go into the community and mimic, you know, what Tony would do. And thereby, you know, when you think about, the whole idea of servant leadership or emotional intelligence, you want someone who's going to keep that cycle going. They want to emulate that leader, you know. So, you know, that's one example uh, from the very harsh uh, climate of the National Football League. There are others, too, uh, without going into a bunch of names. But the reality is that even on the corporate side, you know, there are some individuals I work with, uh, large companies, uh, FedEx, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Uh, Chick-fil-A, I mean, these are individuals that are servant leaders, and they care more about their people as opposed to, hey, it's just the bottom line. If these people don't do what they need to do, then they're out of here. You know, that's that's old hat. You Mm -hmm. know, that's not something that Mm -hmm. uh, people want to ascribe to, and it's not something that's going to get the most out of the followers. You know, and let me... Let me share one other thing with you. I think at the end of the day, too, Megan, we have to remember that followers will show up. They'll show up, Megan, but they will not give their all 
and it's passive resistance. <laughs> that's that's really all right. it is at that it's point. I mean, if you don't work, want right? to, yeah, if you don't want to cultivate their hearts, then sometimes the only way they can show you that they are not on board or they're not bought into the mission or the vision is to say to you, and, and not verbally say it, but through their effort or by, you know, not really fulfilling what they need to do, is to let you know, hey, I'm not bought into this. So which one would you rather cultivate? Do you want a follower that's fully bought in, that's uh, really achieving maximum productivity, or do you want one that's hedging and saying, hey, I'm going to show up and just, just do the minimal and just to get by? I want to make this a little bit personal for our audience today. I mean, tell me, how many football coaches have you had in your lifetime? Uh, oof. Ah, if we go I all the way back. You don't have to. Yeah, just, you know, yeah, let's, let's figure out how many you've had. I really want to break that down and talk about, you know, there's got to be some, some coaches in there who just you never connected with and maybe inspired you to move in that direction of becoming more of a, a servant leader. Um, how many sure. coaches did you have? And, and, and can you give us like some examples of maybe coaching that you don't think is effective on the football field? Sure, sure. Well, like I said, from, if we go your all the way – yeah, if we go all the way back, I mean, typically you have four or five minimum coaches on a team. So I've probably had, I don't know, 100, <laughs> 100 coaches through the year. That's, what, that's uh, what I thought, right. Yeah, so it really gives me uh, a great, I guess you'd say, vantage point. You know, I've I've had right. coaches that would cuss you out and grab your face mask and hit you on the shoulder pass, hit you upside the head. And I've also had other coaches that were more relational in the sense of talking to you in a way where it would motivate you. And you knew that the only thing that stood between winning and losing was your effort. And for that, hey, that was my motivation. And to your point, you asked me very specifically, you know, about the idea of uh, how some of those things may have impacted or I didn't align with uh, particular coaches. Absolutely, especially in the NFL. Uh, there was <laughs> there was two <laughs> that pop up in my head, you know, without saying names. <laughs> Are we gonna uh, name but, names? No, we're not gonna name names. I mean, All but right. at the end of the Check day, th- I can give you an example where you have one coach who, like I said, would curse you out and just really get in your face, and you have the other one that would get you ready uh, in a very, in my opinion, mature and developed. <laughs> emotionally way, you know, as opposed mm-hmm. to all the stuff that who knows what they were bringing onto the field from home or whatever else, you know, right. and they were just bringing Usually it onto the field. Usually it's a whole picture, right? Say that part again? Usually it's a whole picture when somebody brings themselves to their career, and then in this case they're bringing themselves onto a field, right? Sure, it's sure. Well, both, you know, Megan, there is. And, and sometimes negatively. Yeah, and Megan, there's no way that you can separate the two. The only thing you can hope for is that you are mature enough and cognitively developed enough that you can maybe restrain some things. That's what I I talked about with the emotional intelligence piece. I mean, if you are someone that is able to self-regulate, then you know you're bringing baggage. You know that you're bringing home of origin issues, whatever it may be. And it's at that point that you have to make a decision. Are you going to let those things uh, force you and guide you during that day, during that conversation around the board table, or during the conversation around the water cooler? Or are you going to say, you know what, hey, I am developed enough, I'm emotionally uh, mature enough to understand this is not going to help anything, you know, and, and you just kind of go from there. Now, is this an easy thing to do? And especially if we're talking about, uh, something that is so visceral like playing in the National Football League, uh, no, it's not easy to do, but it also speaks to uh, your level of growth and maturity if you can self-regulate enough to be successful and uh, still move forward. So how can an employee or colleague or another leader, for that matter, encourage someone to work on his or her leadership style? How do we get oh. from A to B? Great question. You know, intentionality, um, you'll you'll find 
I share about that quite a bit. I mean, you have to be intentional. One of the greatest barriers to success, and I, and I put a daily quote out. I've been doing that for years now, just to encourage people. Oh, do one you? of the things I, okay. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's where one do you of those do that? Things. Where, yeah, where you do we fr- find your daily quotes? Yeah, if you go if you go right to jasoncarthon.com and you look under uh-huh. coaching, you'll see All right. daily quotes. And it's also out on Instagram, mm-hmm. my Facebook page, Jason Carthen Enterprises. But one oh, of the sweet. things that one of the things that I share with people, and I and I really want our listening audience to get this part. You have to be intentional. Uh one of the biggest barriers is that when human beings engage, we begin to engage by rote. Okay, if you look at Colbert stages of development, we re- reach a certain level, and once we get there, we fall into patterns. And those patterns of behavior will really dictate how we do things going forward. So here's the challenge with that. If you've always done something a certain way, there's a greater likelihood that you're going to continue to do that. So one of the things you want to do is be very intentional with learning very good habits as a leader, and as a follower, because here's what can happen. In an organizational setting, you essentially can really impact the culture in either a positive or negative way. If you want a follower to grow, if you want a follower to develop skills that are going to help the company's bottom line and and impact the culture in a positive way, that leader has to model the way. They have to be intentional with modeling the way. They have to be the one, right? They have yeah, to actually absolutely. show up as absolutely. that person, which is challenging. Maybe you didn't get it a good is. night's sleep last night, right? Maybe you were out <laughs> late partying with your friends. You know, who knows? Well, well so let me tell you something, Megan. Being actually is important, right? Absolutely. Let me share something with you. You know, the mantle of leadership is heavy. It is not something that's light. It is not something that is to be taken lightly. And so what happens, you know, all the things you just mentioned, yeah, they may lend themselves to fun and and opportunities to fellowship and all that stuff. But if you're a leader, then you have a responsibility, and that's what that mantle is all about. And if you're going to model the way, uh, you have to be intentional with it. Because people are going to watch, you know, they're going to they're right. going to watch and they're going to right. try and Especially figure out. Especially now you know, more than ever, right? Sure. Now sure. more than ever, and they're watching. We're all watching. We're all listening. We're all sharing our thoughts, right? Sometimes on an hourly basis. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> on some of these social channels, right? So listen, we're down right. to like three more minutes. Um, tell us a little bit quickly about your newest book, Fifty Two Ways to Tackle Leadership for Your Success. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, hey, excited about this resource. I call it a resource because at the end of the day, I actually wrote this in a way that would allow people to really keep it at the corner of their desk. (laughs) Okay, it's not something that should just be shelved. It's uh, 52 weeks uh, of leadership points and opportunities, you know, for you to discuss. It, It serves as much more than just a book to read through and then put away. And the reason why I did that, I wanted people to have a resource that they could refer back to, and the format allows you to be able to use this. Say, for example, if you're going to, uh, I don't know, have a coaching or a training session or a board meeting, there are some key points in there that I have tied into calls to action. So, for example, if you're talking about conflict, you know, I begin one passage with a quote, you know, and then after the quote, I go into a narrative that gives a rich story of how you can actually talk about whatever the topic may be, the conflict piece. But then the call to action at the end of it says, hey, you know, if you are truly going to deal with conflict, are you looking inside of yourself? Are you able to say, I've done it all that I can do to make sure I'm handling conflict in a healthy way before I ask someone else to do that sort of thing? So there are little nuggets in there Very nice. every week. Yeah. yeah thank you. Well, thank listen, you. everyone's going to check it out. We're excited to kind of take this conversation over to Twitter. Um, remember to use the, the hashtag work trends to participate. And my final potential zinger question for you today is 30 seconds or less. Who is the best leader in the NFL today? In the NFL today? 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, that is a that is a zinger. Well, I'm going to get in trouble for this, uh, but the coach for the uh, Seahawks, I'd go out on a limb, and I can't even pull up his name right now. But the reality That's is, right. his coaching style is more relational. When you see a coach. Uh, run up and grab a player and hug them and engage them, and they talk about their families afterwards with the coach. Right. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. That's that's some positive. Very nice. Stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for sharing with us, Dr. Jason. It's so nice meeting you, and we'll continue this conversation. All right. Thank you. Take care.